Good morning, everybody, white positive, beautiful people. Good afternoon and good evening to some. It is still morning, late morning, here on the west coast of the USA in Northern California. Nathan Lantini, the Blue Ninja, one of many white, uh, white well-being apostles with all of you all here. Uh, I'm going to be heading down back to the LA area today. Uh, <clears throat> today is Monday. I'm not sure if it's August 31st or September 1st. <laughs> Not sure how many days are in August. I know there's 31 in July and 30 in September. So, not sure about August. Um, but it is Monday morning, afternoon, or evening for most of us. <clears throat> and um, before I start my journey through California yet again today, uh, I am going to finish up and continue doing my my other job which is way more important which is the same job that you all are doing which is rising to the occasion being a superhero for Western kind is nothing short of that it cannot be overstated our heroism for what we are doing we are literally saving our people saving our race the white race which is forming as the great white ring literally saving western kind saving our people the people will have a future because of us awesome right so <clears throat> um just to start off right now um i figured i would go shirtless kind of on purpose because just wanted to start off with a little bit of a fun fact. Not every race can grow chest hair. Um, so, white man out there, if you need reminding of how great of a man you have inside of you, even if you have doubts, even if, you know, have these feelings that may uh, come up in your head, <clears throat> anti-white mean pathogens that may tell you otherwise, any doubts, fears, insecurities you may have about how strong you are as a Western man, that greatness that is inside of you that Jason talks about, all of the heroes of the past, the Roman, the great Roman warriors, soldiers, the Greeks, the Spartans, the, um, all throughout Europe, all the great heroes of Europe, and all of our people, Western kind, all over the world, all of that heroism, which is too numerous to name, <clears throat> too numerous to even highlight, all of that has been summed up and put inside each and every one of our hearts and minds spirits the great western bio spirit the great western ring it, we will come together combine all of our talents abilities and all of our greatness into one aggregate whole of a juggernaut of white well-being how great is that so if you need reminding of the greatness of all the Western men that have come before us, that is inside you as a proud white Western man, all you got to do is look at yourself in the mirror, look down, notice that beautiful chest hair. It's just a small indicator of our great manhood. And of course, this, this sounds cliche, but in my travels, I learned that not all races can grow chest hair. Interesting fact. Um, <clears throat> so, just a little, um, <clears throat> little uh, tidbit of a confidence booster. I got more uh, for today. Just one basic idea. Uh, 
but uh, first I gotta start driving. I just wanted to start this off right now with the chest hair thing. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna pause this and come back. But before I pause it, real quick, another idea. A slogan that I think I'm gonna put out on the next shirt that I get. Maybe it's gonna be with the marker. Might be with good old Excalibur Magnum again, old school. Or maybe I'll be able to get him, get him made from the great, the one and only Raymond Foster, or something like that again. Uh, but I got an idea, I think, for the next shirt I want to start wearing, and or just, you know, uh, message to put on posters, flyers, what have you, any which way. Just got an idea for what I want to do next. It just occurred to me. In my travels, I see a lot of anti-whiteism. I see, I've seen matter. Matters, lives, black. Yeah, matters, lives, black, like Jason says yesterday. That was really clever to say it backwards. Like that slogan I've seen on billboards. I've seen, we've all seen it all over. I've seen it a lot, just really a lot <laughs> on people's cars, on lots of stuff. And I've seen it on shirts in the airport um, and lots of other anti-white slogans. So. We need to absolutely feel like we can put any white positive message out anytime. This is this is the time for it. Everyone's doing it. It's not going to be that big of a surprise, really, in light of our current times, that, that to see these racially motivated slogans. We have to defend ourselves. We're being attacked. So, um, this is what I have here is nothing new. <laughs> it's not really my idea. So I have to give credit where credit's due. Obviously, I heard it from Jason. I heard it from all of you all in the white positive sphere. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of people who have had this idea of this particular phrase and had this thought. And uh, maybe the message, this particular phrase is already out there. Nothing new. Um, in fact, I'm almost guaranteed that, that it's out there. Raymond Foster is very likely to put up a flyer with these exact words. <laughs> I would bet more likely than not. Um, so it's nothing new, uh, as far as, or surprising as far as the, as far as the words or anything, but just this particular combination of words just came into me and I think it'll be really, um, powerful because what we're seeing as far as the attacks on us is a lot of, um, just literally attacks on us. It's not so much support, uh, or glorifying non-whites it does happen but it's not nearly to as large of a degree as they try to degrade and attack us they're not as concerned they're not as concerned about making non-whites the good guys as they are making whites the bad guys so again it's not this should be confirmation that anti-whites don't really have the interest of any non-whites at heart their only real goal is to degrade and harm whites. So they put a lot more energy into making whites look bad than non-whites look good. Although both happen, but they put a lot more into to making trying to make whites look bad. And they do this by using the R word, of course, this R-A-C-I-S-M, this anti-white slur, is saying that's the epitome of evil and that's white people they're the only ones that do it so therefore whites are bad they use that word r-a-c-i-s-m and say that's wrong that's wrong and that's 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 white people do it so therefore you know whites are wrong whites are bad that is their attack that's what they use to say that you know whites are wrong because they are r-a-c-i-s-t it's anti-white slur so they're trying to make us look immoral. That's that's a lot of what they do. The anti-white morality is actually inverted morality. They, um, they they try to use morality, which is which is the opposite of morality, which is anti-white morality, to say that we're wrong. We're wrong. We're morally wrong. That's that's why we're bad. That's why it's okay to harm us. That's their justification pretext. <clears throat> in the anti-white narrative. Because a lot of people, especially whites, but even, you know, 
even even non-whites to a lesser degree, they like to have that moral stance to feel like it's okay. And some, and some of them don't even need that. A lot of them don't. But they still put that out there to the society at large. To say, you know, they always want to have that moral appeal. This is right. It's okay to harm whites. Sick, right? But that's what they do. That's how they brainwash people to be, to think. So... I got a really important meme pathogen that, again, came from the Karate Kid. I keep thinking about that movie. Just unbelievable, the meme pathogens. Devastating to me because of how much I watched and liked that movie. This is a personal thing for me. So, but it, it brings out a, a larger, uh, very large anti-white meme pathogen that I think is just really important to bring up. Again, I'm going to talk about that when I'm driving. But for now, the slogan that I'm gonna put out next as much as I can, and it's probably gonna be the next shirt I wear. It's gonna be, it's right here. In light of what I was saying about how the anti-whites attack us, saying we are wrong because of, because we are an anti-white slur, according to their narrative. We are the R word. How many times have we seen the R word, this anti-white slur is wrong? or end this R word, which means end white people. And then and, and, and white people are wrong. That's what they're saying. Um, you know, they, they have all kinds of slogans with this R word, which is all just attacks on white people. And all justification pretext to harm white people. So they've, there's been all kinds of slogans with this R word. Sorry about that, my phone keeps slipping here. Um, you know, war on R-A-C-I-S-M. You know, all kinds of that stuff we've seen. They're declaring a lot war on white people with that. So, they like to really say that that's wrong, right? So, I'm just thinking, let's tell them, we know that's, that's not true. Uh, we know that's just the anti-white narrative, that's an anti-white slur, that is inverted morality, that's not true morality. So I figured, why not just get the message out that is the proper morality in that sense with regard to that kind of a, 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 a topic, I guess. Um, why not get the proper morality out and tell people what is truly wrong? Not what the anti-whites say, that's not what's wrong. What they say is wrong is what's right. And what they say is right is what's wrong. So, we know this, so why not just start bringing things back to the, to the, turning things back to the way they should be, the way they are. Just start reminding people, because people hear something over and over again, no matter how wrong it is, if they hear it every day, all the time, eventually start believing it. That's how we know the brainwashing works. Repetition. Repetition. That's how the anti-whites do it. They can pound in a completely, utterly false, demonstrably false idea they can get people to believe. So we need to start getting the message, the true messages out there. Keep doing that and letting those sink into people's heads to readjust to proper morality and proper reality. So what is this message that I want to put out? Right here. Hopefully you're not seeing the writing too much on the back. It's just something from my company. Totally inconsequential. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Hopefully you can see this this message on the front, which is far more important. Clearly enough. <clears throat> and I guess it's coming out backwards yet again. I can see. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, holding this with my right hand, even though it looks like my left. It's a mirror image. So we can all read this, I'm sure, well enough backwards. We're all smart West men and women. Anti-whiteism is wrong. Anti-whiteism is wrong. Now we know this to be the truth. And of course, this is important because nowadays we see what? We see the anti-whites putting out this message with, instead of anti-whiteism, they're saying the R word, the anti-white slur, ism is wrong 
right? Which is a, which is a false statement. So we need to put out a true statement in a similar manner to tell people what is truly wrong. It's not the R word that's wrong. It is anti-whiteism that's wrong. So we are setting people right. We are giving people the proper message, the proper idea. How do we do this? By using the proper word. It all comes down to that one word, anti-whiteism. Just the word anti-whiteism, people seeing that for the first time is going to make an impact. They'll get the idea. And then to reinforce it, we tell them explicitly it is wrong. Anti-whiteism is what's wrong. It's not the R word. So we tell them, we correct them what they feel inside most people in today's day and age. We just give them the word to express those feelings. Confirm it with them. Say, anti-whiteism is, is what's wrong. Not the R word, not, not anti-white followed by the R word anti-white slur. Just anti-whiteism is wrong. It introduces people to the word. It perpetuates, therefore perpetuates the idea, the right and proper idea that is aligned with true morality and true reality. And it brings a new lexicon out into this public space, the public sphere, and it explicitly lets people know that it is wrong. Anti-whiteism, attacking white people, harming white people is not okay anymore. It is wrong. The anti-white morality is wrong. It is immorality. That's what we're telling people. That not okay anymore to harm whites. It is, we're giving it a name. It is called anti-whiteism. So all, all this, according to the anti-white narrative, people think it's okay to attack, to harm whites, to call them names, to deride them, to discriminate against them, to, to just treat them very, very, very poorly, harm and kill them. They think that's all okay. That's all justified. According to the anti-white narrative, the anti-white morality. So we are changing their morality, turning it on its head, turning all those ideas on its head, aligning them properly again, and saying, in reality, according to true morality, anti-whiteism is wrong. What it's called is anti-whiteism, and it is wrong. It is the most wrong thing out there. Anti-whiteism is wrong. That's what I'm gonna put on the next shirt that I get, maybe with the marker, because I'm already anxious and eager to do it. And if nothing else, writing it down here. I'm probably gonna leave this piece of paper somewhere. Maybe at this rest area, Northern California. Lord knows they need it. We're sort of middle California, Bay Area. Um, anyway, that's that's this. I think that'll be powerful. Because it's going to say, anti-whiteism. Oh, that's an interesting word. People are going to just get it. Yeah, I get what that means. Doesn't sound good. It's wrong. Yeah, I can see that it's wrong. Makes sense. It's going to bring that to their consciousness. Which was probably deep in their subconscious, but they had no idea. It's going to bring that to their consciousness. Yes, that's what I've been feeling. That's the word. That's it. That's the idea. Now they have it in their heads. They can run with it. They can tell others strengthens them. Of course, white people being our main target audience. And it also not only enforces our idea, but it dispels, it breaks the spell of the anti-white ideas, the anti-white morality. It snaps them out of that, thinking that, oh, this R word is the worst thing. Snaps them out of that and they realize, well, maybe that's not the real problem. It actually is anti-whiteism. That makes more sense. I see anti I see whites being attacked way more than any other group. In fact, whites are the only group that are attacked overtly and openly with, with pretext justification or attempted justification. So... <clears throat> um, it's like when people are watching a movie 
right? Like Jason talks about. People just fall into this naturally. They just they get immersed into the movie. Even though they know it's a movie, they know it was actors and everything else. They just but they just they're not thinking about that. They're just watching it. They're letting themselves get into the story. It's a natural thing, even if you're totally aware. Um, but it's just the same when people are watching a movie, as we know, and and then you, you snap them out of it and you say, hey, you know this is just a movie, right? This is all just a movie. It was, it was all, it's all just staged. It's all actors and actresses. It's all directors. It's all been planned. It's all been scripted. It's just not real. Not real. At all. So, in the same way, when when you snap someone out of it and just, boom, remind them, hey, this is a movie, remember that, it's not real, and they, like Jason says, they have that moment and say, oh, they, they snap out of it and they say, oh, yes, 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 right, right, you're right. And they get it, they snap out of it, and because you brought them to the conscious realization of that, they're totally there, they got it, they, they know that, that it's fake. Uh, but it usually takes something to bring them out of that, usually. Usually people don't want to do that to themselves all the time. They, they just, they know it and then they just let it fade away into the background and they just get into the movie again. But we need to practice snapping ourselves out of the anti-white narrative, bringing ourselves to consciousness repetitively. That's how we form habits, right? By doing them over and over again. So whenever we're watching a movie, say, ah, I gotta remind myself, this is just a movie. Then you can go back and watch it, enjoy it if you like it. And then maybe at the end of the movie, or middle, certain points in the movie, the end of the movie, say, that was just a movie. Just remind yourself it's practice. It's white positive muscle strengthening, meme curative strengthening. I can't watch any movies anymore without con constantly thinking about all the meme pathogens that, are, that have probably been, I always have my meme pathogen watch on. I can't turn it off anymore. Always thinking that this is a movie made by directors, producers, people behind the scenes, and the actors and actresses are all just saying their lines. I can't, can't watch a movie without thinking about that now. So, as we become more practice, becoming more conscious about it, just becomes natural um, to, to just to be conscious about it. Um, so. Uh, we need to practice this for ourselves. We need to help other people do it. Um, with movies, with any type of media, there's remind people there's an agenda. There's an anti-white agenda behind all media. Why? Because anti-whites control all media. Every single bit of it. Except for our media and the white positive sphere, of course. Um, but even then, they try to, of course, uh, control it. Um, but, um, so in that same way, with movies, this is the same thing. This is telling people, you are inside a narrative. You're inside, you're living in, in, a, in a narrative, in a fictional story called the anti-white narrative. You're, you're letting people know they're living in a fictional narrative and you are snapping them out of it with this, stuff like this. So they're gonna realize, oh, um, they're gonna have this realization on some level that, oh, yes, they're gonna be reminded that's, that this is just a narrative that I'm being told in the media, just like they have the realization that's just a movie with actors. They're gonna realize, yes, the media is not truth. It's, it's, it's a narrative. It's it's people with an agenda telling you what they want to tell you. They're going to have that realization at some level if they have an intelligence, um, three-digit intelligence or more, IQ, um, and and then they're going to realize, okay, what is true? What is the proper reality? Is this? This aligns more with it. And the more they see that and stuff like that, they're going to realize. Okay, the more they see the truth, the more they're going to like it, the more they're going to realize the anti-white media is false. It's just a fictional narrative. Now, people that have a two-digit two IQ with the first digit, like, seven or eight or less, 
um, probably not going to get much of that, but those people are probably going to be non-white, and um, it's just the way it is, and, you know, who cares, but, so you don't, you don't waste any time on them, uh, if they're anti-whites, you know, of any, of any stripes, white or non-white, we don't waste, we don't waste time on anti-whites any more than we have to, other than defeating them putting them back in their place, which is the sewer where they belong, with all of the, the nasty ooze that they came from. <clears throat> so, obviously we're more concerned about white opinions than non-whites, because what is our objective to save Western kind? Our objective is to save our people, to love and support and heal our people. We're not against a non-whites, we just simply don't care right now about them. We need to care about ourselves. We are the ones in danger. This is where our focus is. Um, so if there's a white person that is not getting this and they can be helped along, obviously we want to take the time to help them along to get them to understand it. That's worth worthwhile time. Most whites with half a brain will get it quick. But if there's a vague that doesn't quite get it, we want to help them along. If there's an anti-white that's kind of just doesn't know any better, maybe they can be helped along. Try a little bit, see how they respond. If they respond well, you can just try to keep going with them, depending on the situation. If they're vehement, vehemently anti-white, as a white, it's the most saddest thing on the planet, I think. Um, but then you just have to let it go. If they're that stupid or that anti-white, that far gone, that brainwashed, there are those people that we all encounter. We recognize it and say, okay, have a nice day. <laughs> Enjoy your anti-white life in the sewer. Um, so that's that. So, anti-whiteism is wrong. We all know this, everyone remember. Anti-whiteism is what is truly wrong. So, I will now pause this. Yet again, turning into a long video. The halfway point, basically. Half hour, we'll go an hour, I think, on this one. And I'll be back with you shortly. Stay strong. Okay, folks. I'm on the road now. Heading south. Um, and I'm not sure that I turned my headset on. <laughs> so, let me... if I could do that right here. Whoops, it was already on. Okay, so it's back on. Um, great, so hopefully voice is coming through here. Back with some Blue Ninja attire, Blue Ninja hit here. Every Blue Ninja's got to have Blue Ninja head gear. <laughs> By the way, I am wearing a mask less than I used to out here. It's that Western rebellious spirit. I'm not going to wear it unless somebody asks me to. That's, that's my plan, just to throw it out there for all of you. I suggest that to everybody. <clears throat> just my own personal view. Uh, which uh, everybody can just take or not take. Mm -hmm. My own personal view is to wear a mask as little as possible. I think masks are ridiculous. They don't do anything. They, they hardly do anything at all to prevent the transmission of a disease that may or not, may not even be out there. Anyhow, um, the mask tyranny is very apparent, especially out west here. They're very strict about it, so. But I notice a lot of people, in general, just are kind of rebelling. They're just wearing it less and less. So, and I think it's important to note that I have never seen a law requiring people to wear masks. I'm almost 100% sure there is still no law. Um, it's, it's just policies, basically. Um, so, you know. There's no law. It's not against the law not to wear a mask. Uh, but um, every business basically does have the right, I 
guess, theoretically, to have you know almost any policy they want and enforce it. Every business pretty much has the right to to uh, refuse service if people refuse to abide by their policies. The problem is that so many businesses have adopted the mask policy, the anti-white mask policy, just to throw that in there because that's why we have COVID. They all choose to do it. I mean, if, if, if just a handful of businesses just decided they weren't going to have that policy, that's all it would take. Just don't have the policy. I don't know why businesses came in like that. Anyhow, um, that's what I suggest. I mean, if you don't like wearing a mask, if you don't want to wear a mask, um, don't wear one. Until somebody asks you to do it. If someone in the store says, yeah, you got to have you wear a mask if you want to be in here. Want to go into that store? Wear the mask. Um, that's my plan. And um, just carry the mask. That's what I'm doing. Just carry the mask. Have it on you. So many places you walk into a store, you don't want to have to go back out to your car or truck or whatever. Just have it on you. So if they do. Say you gotta have it. Just pull it out and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot." Um, when you know it, that's that's what I'm doing. And so far, yesterday, went into a truck stop. They had all the signs, mask required, everywhere. No one said anything to me without a mask. So people are people are all tired of that. I don't think people are enforcing it quite as much as they used to, but it all depends. It all depends on the people and the place. So, that's my little rant about masks. Just gotta put it out there. And so, on to what I wanted to talk about, about the anti-white meat package of the day, which I think is so, we all know, is one of the most disgustingly harmful and false ideas out there. It is anti-insidious, very harmful anti-white meat package. Which I just this morning was reminded of the Karate Kid. And I'm just yet again thinking, man, because a lot of times you'll see an anti white meat package in a movie, you'll recognize it, and then a lot of times, at least for me, I'll think about it later and realize that it was even more insidious than I first rec recognized it to be. It just keeps hitting me over and over again, harder and harder, the significance. Severity and alarm of these new pathogens. Certain ones, especially. So I just happen to think about Karate Kid, and uh, I've been kind of obsessed with it lately. I know. Um, maybe it's the Blue Ninja in me. So disappointed in Karate Kid. So disappointed. So I, I kind of want to be sort of a Karate Kid. <laughs> I want to be the hero. We all want to be the heroes. And us young boys growing up, you know, we like to be tough. We like to, a lot of us, I'm sure, like karate or what have you. We want, we want to be a tough guy on the side of good. We want to be fighting the good fight for our people, for our loved ones, for our for our ladies, us men. We want to fight for our for our women, special women in our lives. Our 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 one special love of our lives, our girlfriend or wife. We men love fighting for our special ladies. And of course, women do the same thing in their own way. Um, but men really have that desire, of course, to be chivalrous, to show valor, to be the knight in shining armor to their woman, to their special woman. So it played on all that stuff for the boys out there and put all those big pathogens in there. And that movie affected all the young boys, like me, a lot of you all. And of course it was the target, young white boys. And also, white girls were targeted, so it was all whites, white boys and girls. White boys were told that they were no good, that they were the bad guy. Johnny, white guy, bad guy, tough, but very bad. You know, 
nobody wanted to be like him in the movie. Boys got the message that the non-white was the hero. They got it subconsciously. Mess what message did the girls get? The girls got the message, the white girl in the movie, the, 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 the beauty queen, white girl in the movie, chose a non-white over a white as her mate, as her boyfriend. So what message did all the little white girls get out there watching? That they should choose a non-white boyfriend, husband, mate. Which is absolute and utter total white erasure. That's what happened. The intent, the one intent of all that stuff is to erase white people off the face of the earth. It doesn't get more insidious than that. So, that's how we see how sick and twisted the directors of that movie are. The makers of that movie. That's what they have in their hearts. They want to erase. And we know the other word that word means, which starts with a G. We know that that's what they want to do to white people. They've been trying to do this for a long time. White G or white erasure. Fun looking place. 
Now in the movie, one mean, one thing is to notice is that in the movie, you see lots of whites walking around, kind of wholesome looking white high school kids in the background of that movie. Uh, if you really pay attention. Nowadays, guaranteed, if you go there, you will see just a couple of whites. If that, it's going to be 90% non-white people at that place, guaranteed. Non-whites of various stripes uh, and shades. So, far different, just thing to notice there. It's not anything like it used to be. Just like the entire area of LA, just like the entire country of America, just like the entire Western world, it's nothing like it used to be. But we're going to take what remnants remain, we're going to rebuild off of the good that still remains. The good is all of us, is right inside all of us, our white Western bio spirits, as white positives, as going free people serving white world we need, saving Western time. This is the, the remnants of our, civiliz our civilizations are not ruins, but even deeper than that, more fundamental is right inside. Our heartbeats still beating, our breath uh, of life, the breath that we are still breathing, breathing the life that we still have inside of us by the grace of God. Probably good Lord himself. Um, the fact that we are still alive here is is Western civilization at its most root level, most fundamental level, as we all know. Um, that Western civilization for the seed lives right here inside each and every one of us, inside all of our hearts, and minds, and souls, and biospirits. <laughs> um, so, the fact that we're all still here, that we're be white positives, are alive this very day, it is proof that God is at work, because us being here means that Western civilization is still alive. We don't have to look around and see it in the world. It's been destroyed to a large extent. And there are, are only remnants around of what it used to be. We can look at that and say, yes, those are remnants of Western civilization. The most key remnant, though, as we know, is we always need to be reminded of the most key remnant. And still strong as ever remnant stronger than ever is I would say seed of a new greater than ever western civilization getting ready to bloom blooming right now as we speak that is right here inside of us just just proof positive every white positive person you see is a fundamental piece of the great white western civilization that is being built, being rebuilt, uh, better than ever, and on the rise once again. So where is Western civilization? You may say, when we look around and we see so many non-whites, we see so much of the non-white bio-spirit in print. Where is Western civilization? Well, it's still alive. It's right here. Right here. You and me, yours truly, and all of everybody out there that's white positive, serving white well-being, going free. We are the core of the core of Western civilization, right here in our bones, in our muscles, in our skin, in our spirits, in our hearts and minds, in everything. We are literally the building blocks of Western civilization. Western civilization was built by God using us as the building blocks. Now we building blocks, serving the Lord, then build further expressions of our 
Lewis said, we know that's a meat pathogen right away. It's why you erase it. So it's a white woman with a non-white man. Young. Now. So this has happened after the, the beautiful white young woman has expressed her disgust for the white man. The white, blonde-haired young man. She's already rejected him few times in the movie by this point, she has expressed her like liking for this non-white. Already a lot of damage been done right there to, to white young boys and girls. Now they're they're on this date and there's there was a previous scene where uh, Daniel, Daniel's a little bit upset at her on this date because he thinks that she is too snobby for him. She, he thinks she doesn't. He thinks she looks down on him because he's poor in the movie and living on the bad side of town. Whereas she is, you know, rich and lives on the very nice side of town in a very big house. at a country club. This, this is all the classic anti-white narrative. And the meat pathogen that I'm going to get to is, as you can probably guess, white privilege. The white girl and guy and all the whites in the movie just, they just live in the fanciest, richest part of town just because they're white. It's just where whites live. They always live in mansions. The richest parts of town. Just Nobody seems to know why, they're just because they're white. You know, it's just where white people come from, it's where they live, everyone just assumes that because of the anti-white narrative. That's what we know. So, um, that, that whole thing was set up from the beginning. There was a scene where Allie and Johnny, the white guy, and their families, a bunch of adults, we're at a wholesome country club party. And Daniel, the non-white, decides to, to just peek in on the party and try to try to just sneak into the party because he can't get in because he is excluded in the movie. You know, he's just a poor non-white guy, so he can't get into those fancy parties because, according to the anti-white narrative, he is non-white. He doesn't have the white privilege. That's the only reason. We know there's nothing that could be more false. Nowadays, it's the whites who are on the street homeless. It's the non-whites who have all the jobs and all the houses. So, nothing could be further from the truth now, but that's the anti-white narrative that they put in the movie. So, there's a scene where Daniel, the non-white, tries to go into the country club. He, through the kitchen, he, he sees Allie and Johnny together. He doesn't realize that Allie doesn't really want to dance with him. And Daniel gets disheartened because he thinks that she is going back together with the white guy that she had dated before. He's upset. He tries to leave in a hurry. He bumps into a waiter in the kitchen and spills a bunch of plates, draws the attention, a lot of attention to himself, makes a scene. Everyone in the party looks over at him. He's embarrassed. Uh, everyone is sort of, you know, kind of seems like they're just laughing at him, uh, sneering at him or whatever, just, just laughing at him. You know, and of course, everyone that scene is designed to make everyone sympathize with the non-white or non-white young kid. And then it's made to make the whites look bad, insensitive, you know, wealthy. And they're just gonna they're just gonna laugh at this poor non-white's embarrassment. All of that is false. Whites in that scene, in 
that movie are the majority. In reality, whites are not the majority. Whites are the minority. Um, it would be reversed. It would be the one white in the room full of non-whites nowadays. Um, even at a country club, it's definitely possible nowadays. Um, and it's definitely the, the, the theme of everyday life now. So, so that's one falsehood, and obviously, um, you know, the, the poor non-white guy, he's poor just because he's non-white, and the whites are rich just because they're white, and the, the white privilege, the dynamic there is obviously false, it's obviously a pathogen, a pathogen that was totally being enforced by the movie, by setting up cameras and filming the scenes that were set up scripts that were given out to actors to be said and just everything was staged and everything was packed. It was all intentional. It was all fake. Always got to remind ourselves of that. It's not real at all. So, there's this scene everyone's meant to, to, to sympathize with non-white Daniel. Then, Daniel thinks that he's humiliated because he, he sees that Allie's he thinks he's going back with, with her white you know, ex-boyfriend. So he's kind of, that's why he's upset with her later when they go to golf and stuff. Um, he's kind of upset. He thinks that she's going back with, with the white guy. And um, he's upset with her and starts kind of expressing that to her indirectly. But instead of just expressing it directly, clearly, and saying that, you know, I saw you kissing Johnny uh, at that, that party the other night, what was going on there, instead of just being clear about it, he immediately launches in to the anti-white narrative about white privilege. Straight into it. It was completely scripted by the anti-whites who wrote and directed that movie. So Daniel, what did he say? He said, he said, you know what? Well, actually, first thing Ali said is she doesn't understand why she's mad at him because he's not being clear. She doesn't know that he saw what he saw at that country. She's kind of confused why he's upset with her. And then she ends up kind of getting her feelings hurt. But before she gets her feelings hurt, she says, she says, you know, Daniel, I, I, I don't understand why you're upset with me. Uh, and she says, I, I didn't go out with you because of the car you drive or where you live or anything. What does that anything imply? It implies he is non-white. That is implicit, not explicit in the movie. Because this is back in the 80s. And things were not as bold back then as they are now. Now it's all explicit. But she says, I didn't go out with you because of the car you drive. Or he, he had to get driven there on the state by his mom. He didn't even have a driver's license or a car yet. So... Again, made to just sympathize with this poor non-white kid. He doesn't have a car, he doesn't have a driver's license. His mom had to drive him, uh, you know, and his day out. This poor non-white kid. All made to sympathize with the non-white. Then, there was also, as they were getting dropped off, of course, the writers of the movie had to script it so that the white guys with Johnny had to drive up in a really nice car, convertible, and just play the part of white privilege. And, um, and he, he played the part of rich white kids just because of white privilege. Can't that white here. Threw that in there. So Daniel, of course, is going to be feeling bad because he just saw the rich white kids in their nice car. So now he's going to feel the need in the movie to tell Allie to accuse her, he essentially accused her of, of white privilege and of being prejudiced against him.
so he's, she's confused. Why, why, are, you know, where's all this, this uh, discontent that he had? She, she was asking him, where, where is it coming from? Well, what is this? And he, she says, you know, you know, Daniel, I didn't go out with you because of the car you drive, where you live, or anything. You know that that anything meant that he is not white. Or anything meaning that white race, essentially. What that anything, what she was talking about, that was implied. So, I didn't go out with you, Daniel, because of the car you drive, or where you live, or anything, or because of your race. different. He launches right into it. He says, he says, yeah, we are different. It's 
if he's the one that is allowed to have a righteous anger. It's unrighteous. He says, yeah, we are different. You know how we're different? I'm from, and he named some city that's, you know, supposed to be a poor part of LA. I'm from, from such and such place, and you're from the hills. You know, the rich, the rich and rich part of town, the white part of town. Listen, that's how we're different. He, he puts it on her. He blames her. He says to her, you're the one that's uncomfortable with me because I'm not from the hills. I'm not from, I don't go to the country clubs. I don't have the money in my family. I'm, I'm poor, I'm not white, all implicit. You're the one white, white girl who's uncomfortable with it. He's bullying her, making her feel bad about that. What are white girls getting, getting the message? All the white girls watching that movie are feeling right along with Allie, the actress, they're feeling bullied just as much as she is with her role in the movie. Every white girl watching that is feeling as if they were being bullied themselves by watching that scene. Why are they feeling bullied? They're, they're being bullied because according to the movie, they're not accepting non-white. Even though Allie is trying to accept it. So, he starts bullying her. You're the one that's uncomfortable with me as a non-white, as a poor, as a poor non-white from the wrong side of town. You know, you're the one that's uncomfortable, Miss Miss White Girl. Um, and in reality, that's the furthest thing from the truth. The non-whites are the ones that are uncomfortable. They're the ones that are insecure. Um, sorry about that noise again. Don't know why these roads are this bad in some parts. And this truck, I don't know, maybe it's the truck. <laughs> um, so, so Daniel, as a non, as a non-white, is making her feel bad. Is bullying her, saying that she is the one uncomfortable with him, just because he's different. He's poor. He's non-white. Total anti-white narrative. Totally false. Totally cruel. Him to bully her for that unjustly, falsely. So he has an incorrect assessment of the situation, and he incorrectly, wrongly bullies her. But the anti-whites frame it in such a way that they give him a pretext to do that. But we know this was this is wrong of him. So he bullies her. Now in reality, anyone who's smart enough to realize will know that even in the movie, clearly him that's the one that's uncomfortable and insecure. He just blames her for that. He just puts it onto her. Even in the movie, if you're perceptive, you can tell. He's the one bringing it up. She's not bringing it up. She's perfectly fine, comfortable, happy to be with him. She's secure. He's the one that's insecure. He was talking about the stuff. And why was that put into the movie? Just to perpetuate that part of the entire way narrative. White privilege. Now, she then is disgusted by him bullying her, finally gets her, you know, her feelings hurt. And says, you know, enough's enough. I, I don't want to, I don't have to take this anymore. She, she gets put off by him being so harsh with her on that. And he says, you know what? We're different. You're from the hills. I'm from this side of town. That's just how it is. You know what I mean? We're, that's what he's saying to her. We're different. And you don't like it. You're not comfortable. He says to her, you're not comfortable. You can't admit you're not comfortable with the situation the way it is. He puts it on her. He says she's the one that's uncomfortable with the difference. With the differences between them. In reality, she never expressed anything that would give that impression. He was the one that was uncomfortable. Wrongly blames her for that. She tries to justify herself in the anti white narrative, which is a mistake. And then, with his bullying, she finally gets upset and walks away. And hurt. She's hurt. Her feelings are hurt. 
by design. It was all made so that the anti-white who wrote the movie could strip that so he could get that piece of anti-white narrative in there and the white privilege stuff. And bully young women into thinking that they have to choose not white as mates. So after that was done, then, then, then the friend comes over and then he tells her what he's really so upset about. And he says, she says, why, why are you treating her this way? She's never been anything but nice to you. And it's true. She's been just nothing but nice to him the whole movie. Most people overlook that. And they still side with Daniel because they think he has a justification. They think he has, according to the anti-white narrative, the justification to feel that way. The moralization intellectualization, sentimentalization. So this would be a case of moralization. They're trying to moralize his non-white, anti-white position. Um, and sentimentalize it. Not so much intellectualize it. Now, so this friend says, look, hey, she's never been anything but nice to you. What's, what's your problem? That's when he comes out with it and says, well, you know, she had her face, you know, uh, uh, planted together with, 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 uh, with, he doesn't even say his name, with what's his face at the country club. You know, she says like, oh, she's never been anything but nice to you. And he says, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't tell based on how she had her face, you know, planted together with what's his face. Her and, and what's his face had their had their faces planted together kissing. He said something like that. He just he didn't even say his name. He just said what's his face. He's just a white guy. He's just another white guy. Blonde white guy. He's just a what's his face. Derogatory term way to refer to him. Everyone feels this is justified because the white guy, Johnny, is the bad guy in the movie. So people feel like he's totally justified to deride him. Now, so he says essentially, well, yeah, I couldn't tell that she liked me because she had her face planted together, smooching with, uh, with what's his face, Johnny, long haired, stubby white guy. Who was, ever, who was dressed in a suit at that party? Everyone looking very classy, very proper in that scene at the country club. So she says, she, he, he says, gee, I couldn't tell. And by the way, they were they were had their faces playing together, smooching at the party the other night. Uh, sure, sure seems like she likes him rather than me. And um, the friend of of Alex says to him, oh, is is that what's bothering you? That. Oh, you didn't you didn't stick around for the exciting conclusion. You didn't see what happened after that. After they and, and what happened in the movie was Johnny essentially forced her to kiss him. She, she kind of grabbed her, forced her to kiss him. She, she didn't really want to do it. Again, making him the bad guy. So Daniel didn't stick around to see what happened after that. As Allie was you know, upset. Put off, uh, just totally disgusted the fact by Johnny trying to force her to kiss him. And then after he did that, she pulled away and then she kind of punched him, slapped him really hard. And but Daniel didn't see that part, so he thought they were just both kissing each other willingly. So this friend at the at the next scene explains, oh, is that what's bothering you? You didn't, you didn't stick around for the conclusion. And he said, what? What happened? She, she said, uh, her right hook. You know, she she punched him. She was she was upset. You know, she didn't want that. She doesn't really like him. 
which he should feel like. Just, oh, I didn't know. Oh my gosh. You know? So he instantly realized that he's, he's a total idiot and it was wrong. He goes over to her and just makes it all up to her, apologizes, says, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I'm an idiot, whatever. Of course, accepts his apology and starts laughing again and they make up and everything's good from that point on. They have a great time on the rest of their date and, uh, and they continue staying together the whole rest of the movie. So, um, long-winded explanation as usual of that meme passage in, in that movie. The, essentially, the meme passage in there, there's a lot of them actually there. It's, you know, every time I think I'm going to talk about one, when I introduce it and set it up, I end up going into a lot of other ones because there's so many that are there. In that particular movie, just like lots of movies, most movies out there, they come from Hollywood. And I love what was on at the start of Jason's stream yesterday. Hollywood is not history. It's the first time I've heard that. Or, well, one of the first times I've heard that. We all know that Hollywood is not history. That's a great meme purity. Hollywood is not history at all. It's false. It's fake. It is in that way. So, um, you know, that was one that I thought of that it was really, really insidious. The white privilege was illustrated with the country club scene with the whole setup of the movie. The white girl that comes from a good upper class white family um, dating a, a poor, a supposedly poor non-white, lower class. That's how I narrative. Of course, all these meat pathogens, she is choosing him, she likes him, all this stuff. All hideous anti-white meat pathogens. Now, the one I wanted to focus on here was the right the white privilege stuff. Obviously, in the context of this one, it was white privilege in the context of dating, in the context of a of a white young woman dating a non-white young man. Very insidious. It's absolutely it was white privilege, and it was also um, used to incite and promote biological white erasure. Whites dating non-whites. So the seeds were being planted back in the 80s for sure. A lot. Unbeknownst to most of us. Now, the white privilege thing in particular, I, I just really honed in on this morning. As a scene occurred to me, occurred to me. It hit me deeper because that scene, all those scenes, gave the impression of what? We all know the anti-white narrative, white privilege, that whites are privileged, white have, whites have more, whites are rich just because they're white. And indeed, I've seen it so many times in my conversations with non-whites of various different shades and stripes. You know, like when I started with this trucking company a few weeks ago, I had to do some training, as a lot of you will remember, with some Latino non-whites, a couple guys. One guy I was able to reach and turn it into a white positive conversation, but the way he started out the conversation was he was completely filled with the idea of white privilege in his head. Even though I was sitting right next to him as a white guy that was much, much poorer than him. So even though even though the reality was absolutely the opposite of the anti-white narrative, he still had the anti-white ideas in his head. So by our conversation, he, he made comments that made it clear that he thought he had the impression that whites just have it better, they just have more money, they have more stuff, they live 
bit better just because they're white. They're white, so this is they just have to have more just because they're white. That's just their immediate automatic thought. Russian. So now this white privilege thing is deeply embedded in the psyche of everyone in Western countries. Including whites, even whites that are poor like me. Um, the, the knee jerk reflex thought chains are there. Now, why do have why do people have trouble perceiving, really understanding that whites could be dirt poor? Whites could be really downpressed and oppressed, really the lower rungs of society financially. Why do people have a hard time really getting that? Even when they see it. Because of the pathogens that have been put inside of us for a very long time. Programming that has been happening for a very long time. Many, many decades. Now, and for, for, for at least over a century. So, in our societies. Now, by the same token, why do people instantly think that only non-whites can be poor? You know, all they instantly think of non-whites as poor, underprivileged, they don't have it as good, just because they're non-white. think that only non-whites can be poor. They think that basically all non-whites are poor. They think that to be poor, it's a prerequisite to be non-white. You have to be non-white to be poor. You cannot be poor if you're white. That's what people subconsciously think. It's a pre-qualification. And likewise, they also think that if someone is non-white, they, they must be poor. They have to be poor because they're not white. They're poor because they're not white and they're not white because they're poor. That's essentially kind of the two-way Yeah. 
hard time believing. If I tell people I'm poor and I'm nearly on the street, this close from being on the street at any given time these days, um, do they believe me? Most people don't believe me. They just, they just, they, they have a block. They just have a hard time believing. Why do they have a hard time believing it? Because of the anti-YV pathogens inside of them. The programming, the brainwashing that has been going on for decades and decades and decades is completely false. They have that idea. Now, the fact that most people just have that idea and the programming has been going on for that long and people have such a hard time getting past the anti-white idea, the pathogen of white privilege. The fact that it is so ingrained is very significant. So, it's not just something we can break overnight. It's not just something you can tell, no, whites don't have the privilege. Whites are the downtrodden, whites are at the bottom. When I told this Latino guy that I was driving with the other week, that no, in fact, whites are the lowest, the poorest. You know what he said to me? He said, no, no, no way. He totally denied me, utterly. I said, yes, and I got a little bit upset because I'm in that position. He still couldn't see me. Talking to him from that position, he still couldn't see me. I would not, I mean, he, he just said, no, no, no. I said, no, we whites are the bottom, just instantly. Knee-jerk response, no, 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 I can't be. Why did he think that couldn't be? Because I'm white. You can't be poor, you're white. That's what he was thinking. That was a subconscious thought process. I brought it to the consciousness. I said, just because I'm white doesn't mean I can't be poor. I had to actually explain that to him. Then, luckily, by the grace of God, he started to accept it. All I had to say to him to really change his mind was, how many whites do you see around here? In the LA area, outside of LA, wherever. Just all the whole LA area. I, I asked him, everywhere you go around here, everywhere you drive, how many whites do you see? Right there, that changed his mind. And that really brought the mean pathogen to the forefront. He was able to recognize that it was not reality. He was able to recognize the real reality. But I had to point it out to him. I mean, even though he can see it every day. I had to say, how many whites do you see around here? He just looked at me his jaw hanging open, you're right, not very many at all, you know, just a few whites here and there, that's all, and he gave me that look of, oh wow, the light bulb finally went off, I saw it, he said, you're right, not very many whites anymore. So that's what started our conversation going in a more positive direction, which was good from that point on. He accepted it to his credit. He accepted the reality once I showed him that. A lot of people wouldn't even accept it even after having it been pointed out. As obvious as it is. So some people are just that anti-white. I realized, okay, he's not anti-white. He's able to accept the reality. He just didn't know. And then it was it sounded like he was willing to become white positive. So, you know, that's how that got turned around. But that, that anti-white being pathogen of white privilege was firmly in his head. It will still be there. But for the first time in his life, someone pointed it out. So that's what we do, folks. That's, we point out anti-whiteism, we point out the pathogens. We bring people to reality. That's what we're doing. We are, they are living in a fantasy land hellscape 
a nightmare land called the anti-white narrative.
nothing less than saving Western time, the great reviving the great white Western biosphere every single minute of every single day. We are doing this all together collectively. Signing off here.